The idea that human beings are primarily motivated by self-interest, inherently competitive, or even just born evil has permeated Western culture for centuries. Theories and studies from philosophers and historians, from Machiavelli to Thucydides to Thomas Hobbes, have influenced major social, economic, and foreign policy decision-making. Not so, argues Dutch historian and author Rutger Bregman. He believes people are, well, actually fundamentally pretty decent. His latest book, Humankind, A Hopeful History, proposes a new worldview predicated on what he refers to as survival of the friendliest. But then how do you explain some of the darkest chapters in human history? I'll ask Rutger Bregman in an upfront special. Rutger Bregman, thank you so much for joining us on Upfront. Thanks for having me. Uh, the news media is often filled with daunting and even pessimistic headlines about the future, whether it comes to climate change or pandemics, endless wars, or human rights atrocities. But in your book, you write that we're actually, quote, living in the richest, safest, healthiest era ever. Can you explain your thinking behind that? Yes, this is pretty astounding, isn't it? But if you look at the uh, if you look at the simple statistics that we have, it's pretty clear as well. So most people don't know that extreme poverty has declined by more than 50 percent since the 1980s. Most people don't know that child mortality has declined by more than 50 percent since the 1980s. If you see, see the rise in vaccinations, for example, against terrible diseases such as measles, that used to be just 20 percent of the world population. Now it's more than 80 percent. So in many respects, we are making progress as a species. It could have been a headline, you know, for the last 25 years that around 200,000 people were pulled out of poverty every single day. But because it haven't, happens every single day, people don't really feel it, right? The news is often more about what happens today, you know, and that's usually the bad stuff. But you also make an argument in your book about the fundamental nature of human beings and that humankind, at the core, as you say, are pretty decent. The examples you give could make could be making the case that as a society things are getting better because it's in our interest to get better, but that that doesn't that, that mm -hmm. it doesn't speak to our fundamental human nature. What do you say to that? Yeah, the reason why I wanted to, to write this book is that in the last couple of decades we've seen a major shift in science. So many scientists from very diverse disciplines, uh, anthropology, psychology, archaeology, uh, sociology, you name it, they've been moving towards a more hopeful view of human nature. You know, a more hopeful picture of who we are deep down as a species. Um, and the thing with these specialists is that they're so specialized that they often don't realize what's going on in the field next to theirs, right? Yeah. And that's the reason why I wanted to write this book, is to give people the big picture of what's, what's been happening, what's been going on, is that scientists are now emphasizing that we are not fundamentally selfish. No, we've evolved to cooperate. We are actually uh, a product of what they call survival of the friendliest which really means what you think it means. It means that for the biggest part of our history, when we were nomadic and gatherers, you know, which was around 300,000 years, um, it was actually the friendliest among us who had the most kids and had the biggest chance of passing on their genes to the next generation. Friendliness helped us to survive. It was our secret superpower. Now, I think that's a pretty major shift in, in how we look at human nature. And that's why I wanted to write this book. I, I think I'm struggling with it, you know, and I found your book quite provocative. I found your, your, your reach into various disciplines and histories to be quite compelling. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm just haunted by these extraordinary historical examples of people just doing awful things, from uh, the colonization of the Americas in the 1400s to the Holocaust and World War II, uh, the Rwandan genocide more recently, 1994, and of course some archaeologists, as you well know, I believe that war has existed since the, the, the Mesolithic era, over 10,000 mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, how do you help me make sense of this? Are you saying that all of these people since the dawn of civilization who've committed some of the worst atrocities were simply motivated by things like kinship to the group as opposed to any kind of internal malice or, mm -hmm. or malevolence or violence inside of them? You know, I'm, I'm struggling to reconcile that. Yeah, yeah. Well, any book about human decency will obviously have to acknowledge that we humans are also the cruelest species on the planet. I mean, we do things that no other animal would even think of doing. We commit genocides, you know, all kinds of atrocities. Warfare seems to be a quite, you know, specific form of, of human behavior. 
um, that you just don't see with any other animal. I've never heard of a penguin, you know, or a group of penguin that says, let's, let's exterminate another group of penguins, right? So these are singularly human crimes. You have to deal with that. What I want to show in the book, though, is that it is too simple to say that this is just in our nature, you know, that we've just always been doing this. Because, for example, if you look at the archaeology and the anthropology of war, you start to realize that war is actually a quite recent invention. For the biggest part of our history, you know, when we were nomadic and gatherers, people did not engage in warfare. You know, there's no archaeological evidence whatsoever for that. So that makes you think, what went wrong? Now, if I would give the quickest possible summary of, of the thesis in the book, it would be something like, most people deep down are pretty decent, but power corrupts. You know, power is this very dangerous drug. And once hierarchies start to arise, and you really see that, when people settle down, when they start living in villages and cities, when they invent agriculture, uh, you see that all kinds of terrible things happen, whether it's the invention of the patriarchy, the invention of private property, the uh, the era of warfare against. So I'm just giving you the big picture here. Um, I, 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 but that is, but, that but, is but, 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 but I guess what I'm struggling with, there, there are two things here. One, and, and you, you give excellent, you know, in, both in the book and elsewhere, sort of analysis of why people might participate in awful activities during, during the Holocaust mm -hmm. or awful activities during the Rwandan genocide. And in many ways, you link that to their desire to follow orders or the desire to not let their friends down or the desire to be connected to a broader instrument. Does that not let people off the hook for their own choices? Hmm. I think that's a good point. Look, I'm, I'm not in the business of, of proclaiming that people are fundamentally good. I think that people are fundamentally cooperative and fundamentally friendly. And sometimes that's exactly the problem. If I, if I could just tell you one short story, um, in the midst of the Second World War, the Allied psychologists were wondering why the Germans were fighting so hard still in 1944 and 1945. Um, they had all these theories. The most popular theory at the time was that the Nazis must have been brainwashed, you know, that these soldiers were just, you know, ideological maniacs. And that was the reason why they were still fighting in 45 when it was clear that we we're going to lose the war. But then they started interviewing prisoners of war and they discovered that actually the main reason why these men kept fighting was... Well, in German, Kameradschaft, comradeship. They were basically fighting for their friends. And the German army command knew this. You know, they, they very deliberately kept these bands of brothers, if you will, these, these groups of friends together, because they knew that was the most important reason why these men were still fighting. Now, I, I'm not saying this to condone anything. I'm trying to explain things in, in this book. Yeah. And that's that's different from saying, oh, look, these people were just fighting because they were monsters or maniacs or they were fundamentally selfish or evil. I think that's a much too shallow explanation. You I guess see? what I'm wondering is this commitment to comradeship, if it's in the service of something evil, you read that as a sign of human decency because they're allying with their friends, whereas some of us might read that as perfect evidence of how awful people are, because they're, they're more inclined to do evil things, visibly evil things, in order to maintain yeah. a social relationship, which in many ways is a very selfish desire, rather than to yeah. help uh, someone outside of their own immediate sphere of control. That, 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 that's yeah. all. And again, yeah, maybe, I I just read, maybe I just read too much, uh, too, too much Hobbes and not enough Rousseau. Uh, but but, but, no. but that's where, that's where I, I keep, <laughs> as I read your book, I found it so compelling, and yeah, I just kept, it kept getting stuck there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see your point. I, look, I think you're just absolutely right. What, what I guess you, you got to realize, though, is that what I'm fighting against in this book is what scientists call veneer theory. And veneer theory is this notion that people are fundamentally selfish, that our civilization is just a thin layer, yeah. you know, just a thin veneer, and that as soon as something bad happens, say a crisis, an earthquake, a war, whatever, that people basically are, are all in it for themselves. You know, they start looting, they start plundering. And this is a story that's very often, you know, being told yeah. to us. Also, you know, uh, in, in media, you remember uh, maybe after Katrina in 2005, the story was full of stories about, uh, or the press was full of stories about looting and plundering. In the end, that turned out, you know, to be factually incorrect. So um, our pessimistic, our cynical view of human nature has really negative consequences. What we assume in other people is often what we get out of them. So I'm not in the business of, of you know, proclaiming that, that, that people are angels or anything like yeah. that. Obviously not. We're capable of terrible atrocities. But our, our theory of human nature really, really matters. It can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think it really pays 
to assume the best in others around us. In, in 2019, you went viral at Davos when you called out all the millionaires and billionaires who were in the crowd. You said that they can talk about, quote, stupid philanthropy schemes, but that people really need to be talking about tax avoidance because the rich simply are not paying their fair share. Uh, it's been three years since you made those statements, and frankly, nothing, nothing's really changed at all. I economic inequality continues mm. to grow. The rich are still exploiting tax loopholes without any accountability. Corporations are still dodging taxes left and right. What does the lack of progress on this issue say about the relationship uh, between wealth and responsibility? I guess I'm a little bit more hopeful. I wouldn't say I'm optimistic, but I am hopeful because I do see change. Um, if we just zoom out a little bit and look at what has happened in the last, say, 10 to 15 years, we've seen the rise of so many big movements, whether it's Me Too or Black Lives Matter or Fridays uh, for Future, you know, the climate movement. Um, and actually also in the fight against tax evasion, we have actually seen progress. The problem 15 years ago was that no one was talking about it. You know, this was all in the shadows, but now it's been politicized and now people are starting to get angry about it. And actually, you know, Switzerland already had to abolish its, its um, uh, secrecy laws, bank secrecy laws. So that's some progress. Actually, the fact that people are starting to get angry about this is in itself a sign of progress. This is one very paradoxical phenomenon that we often see in the public debate, you know, is that the very moment that people start to get angry is already when we're making progress. And that's because they're getting angry. And, and that's, that's exactly what we should be. Just taking a step back for a moment, your assessment of human nature is that we're, th there's this decency here, but that the power has a corrupting force. And, mm -hmm. and cap capitalism kind of n normalizes the idea that someone's going to be powerful, someone's going to have, and someone's not going to have. Is it possible within the context of capitalism to ever get to a place of actual justice, of equality, of uh, not mm -hmm. having a, a kind of oligarchic rule over the world, uh, can we ever get there as long as we have this kind of class defending state in place? Can we can we get to the ultimate vision inside of a capitalist mm. world? Hmm. So I've never really liked these dogmatic debates about capitalism versus socialism. It's pretty clear to me that you can have terrible capitalist societies such as the U.S. where our life expectancy is actually going down right now. I mean, U.S. GDP per capita is like 50 percent higher than in Spain, but people live five years longer in Spain. So clearly something's going better there. There's a, there's a huge amount of diversity, uh, obviously. So the way I envision it is that a civilized, just society has, uh, provides all these public services, you know, high quality healthcare, high quality public education, uh, a basic guaranteed income for everyone. Uh, we're more than rich enough right now to completely eradicate poverty. And I think that's actually an investment that pays for itself. But then, yes, sure, there are still places for companies and markets. I don't think we should b abolish markets altogether. If you visit Finland, for example, or Costa Rica, I mean, these are technically capitalist societies, but, you know, so radically different from, for example, the United States. So I sometimes fear we get lost in all these theoretical debates and we we forget to focus on, you know, just a concrete task that, that, that lies ahead of us, which is just, you know, building movements, drafting legislation, and winning. <laughs> Fair enough. I think that's what we got to do. Would standing on the right side of history involve maybe redesigning our political and economic systems in ways that don't assume that we're awful, that don't assume that we're monsters, that don't assume that we, that we will look out for ourselves even in moments of crisis? I mean, is there a way to design a different system? What, what, what could a different world look like in the context of what you're describing? Mm -hmm. So I think that the idea of updating your view of human nature towards a more hopeful view of humanity is quite revolutionary. There's a reason why throughout history, those who have advocated this more positive view have often been persecuted. So if we look at the anarchist tradition, for example, maybe you know uh, Peter Kropotkin, the Russian yeah. anarchist in the 19th century. He believed that m people are fundamentally good. And well, he had to basically uh, run around the globe, you know, hiding from the S Russian secret service because those at the top understand that a positive view, a hopeful view of human nature is downright seditious. If people can trust each other, 
then they no, don't need kings and queens anymore. They don't need armies and secret services and CEOs and managers and you name it. Then maybe we can move to a much more egalitarian and genuinely democratic society. That sounds like an um, anti-capitalist so, society to me. I mean, not, 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 to, not, to, <laughs> not to linger here too long, but everything you're describing sounds like can only happen if we dismantle... The hierarchies you're talking about only happen if we dismantle capitalism. Sure, sure. Well, I'm all in favor of going beyond capitalism, post-capitalism, blah, blah, blah. But as I said, I'm, I'm normally not super interested in all these, you know, highbrow ideological debates. I'm, I'm more interested in, okay, what are we going to do concretely tomorrow? Okay. So that's why in the book, I included a lot of case studies of organizations of, well, even criminal justice, whole criminal justice systems that try to implement this. So for example, if you go to Norway, they have a completely different kind of prison system. You visit the prisons there and, well, it doesn't look like a prison at all. You know, the prisoners are treated humanely, get the freedom to socialize with the guards, to make their own music. There's one prison that even has its own music label called Criminal Records, you know? Um, and um, if you then look at the results of these kind of institutions, well, you can look at one thing that criminologists call the recidivism rate, you know, which is the chance that someone will commit another crime once he or she gets out of prison. Well, that recidivism rate is nowhere as low as in Norway. So even though these places don't look like prisons at all, they're the most effective prisons in the world. Now, if you compare that to the US, US prisons are more, well, Kropotkin, the anarchist I just mentioned, called them uh, universities for crime. So we take pa taxpayer money and we build these terrible places that actually turn you know, people into yeah. they're, they're criminogenic. You know. They produce they produce more uh, exactly. more, more crime. Let me uh, talk to you a little bit more about this question of power, because in some ways you talk about power almost like if it's a boogeyman that it's outside of human agency, that it's outside of who we are as a people. Um, if mm -hmm. if that is in fact the case, what is what generates this power? What help me understand what power is and how we can dismantle it. Hmm. Power is absolutely essential to the human experience. So even anarchist organizations, th they can't think away power. It's always there, even if it's not institutionalized or formalized or whatever. So it always needs to be kept in control. And if you study nomadic hunter-gatherer societies, they had a very straightforward way to do this. They used the power of shame. So shame is really essential in human societies. Humans are the only animal in the animal kingdom with the ability to blush. I mean, isn't that astounding, right? We involuntarily give away our feelings to other members of our species in order to establish trust. So, so that was really important. In those kind of societies, once you would start to behave in a two narcissistic ways, you know, people would shame you. So humbleness would really be a prerequisite as a leader in a, in a uh, horizontal society like that. Mm. Now, what we see in more hierarchical societies like the one we, we live in today is that actually sit shame, shamelessness can sometimes be positively advantageous, right? Which is very much the opposite of how things used to be. We now sometimes have uh, politicians or leaders who are able to do things, you know, that other people, you know, just wouldn't be able to do, right? Because they would just immediately start blushing. But if, if you just think of, say you're the president in your specific country and think of like, when was the last time I s saw him or her blushing, right? <laughs> it's pro probably hard to remember. You know, that's not really what you do in, in, in politics these days. So there seems to be something in the hu human psychology itself. And this has been um, studied even in brain scanners is that under the influence of power, you become less empathetic. It's as if you become disconnected as I said, there are neurological studies that show that people seem to mirror each other less. So mirroring is a really um, essential part of the human experience. You know, we copy each other all the time. You start yawning, I start yawning as yeah. well, right? Um, people who are in more powerful positions, they, they do this way less, right? Mm. So it seems as if they're less in sync with the rest of humanity. Mm. And um, I mean, there's so many pauses in place that almost concede uh, the disposability of, of people. Uh, or they believe that brutality, violence, harm, it's, it's just how it is. It's just, it's just the way human nature yes. is. For example, we'll see a global outcry over an image of a young child, you know, their lifeless body washed up on a European beach, just one of countless, you know, migrants who are struggling to get to safety. Mm -hmm. uh, but border policies in most countries don't change. They remain incredibly restrictive. Yes. Uh, you yeah. could even say inhumane. You know, again, like, how do yeah. we end up yeah. with these cruel yeah. policies if people are fundamentally geared toward 
as you say, cooperation and taking care of each other. Yes, yes. Well, I can't, I'm not saying that humans are angels. On the one hand, no, but this, we is, are, this is beyond being we an are, angel. We're talking about mass yes, death, yes, yes. systemic inequality, structural harm that we see every single day. You don't have to be an angel to not want uh, child sure, labor sure. or people washed up on a shore or sure. you know these kinds of things. Yeah. 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 But you're right that our empathy is limited. You know, there's one psychologist called Paul Bloom who's written a quite terrific book with the title Against Empathy, where he argues that the problem with empathy is that it's more like a spotlight. It's a certain light, right? It helps you to focus on a specific group or a specific person, right? One child that, you know, washes up on our shores and then everyone's shocked. But it's very hard to look at a statistical number and feel the same outrage, right? There's, there's this quote from the philosopher Bertrand Russell that I always loved. He, he once wrote, the mark of a civilized mind is to look at a row of numbers and be able to weep. And I guess that's the challenge. If I, if I tell you five million kids every year die from easily preventable diseases, well, you don't feel much probably, but these are five million children, you know, with, with parents who, who really, really love them. So um, what we got to try and do here is overcome our cognitive limits, overcome our emotional limits uh, and realize that we can, um, and we should also help people who, you know, we don't instinctively feel all these kind of things uh, about. And that is possible. I mean, we again, we have made progress in, in quite a few respects, um, but we're not nearly there yet. Fair, fair enough. One of the things you talk about in the book that I really appreciate, and you talk about this throughout your career, uh, is this idea of not just knowing what we're going to fight against, but also having sort of an affirmative vision, you know, knowing what we're, what we're fighting yeah. for, what our, what our goal is. Talk about what that means to you. So when I wrote my first book, which is called Utopia Freelist, I was frustrated that young people uh, at the time didn't really have a big positive vi vision. Right? They mainly knew what they were against. This was just after, uh, after the financial crash of 2008, and we were all against the establishment and against austerity and against homophobia and against racism. And obviously, I also was against all those things, but I felt what's actually our lodestar? What's something we're striving for? What could be a utopia for the future? I mean, the end of slavery and democracy and the welfare state, all these great achievements, they were once utopian until they happened. So in history, quite a few times, we've seen the impossible become inevitable. And um, that's what I've been looking for. But, you know, the thing is, there, there's there's quite a few reasons to be hopeful, because I think that Young people today do have a much more positive, hopeful view, future uh, uh, vision of where we could go if we radically change our society. And, and you help us with that vision. I mean, you have some concrete ideas yourself of what we can yes. do to change the world. Uh, you talk about universal basic income, 15-hour uh, work weeks, uh, open borders, mm -hmm. all of this stuff. What would your utopia for realists, uh, as you put it, look like? So... Maybe it's interesting to zoom in on that first idea, universal basic income. When I first wrote about it, I think that was in 2013, it was a pretty much forgotten idea. Most people hadn't heard of it. There were some people here in the Netherlands who were asking me like, oh, basic income, is that sort of the base salary of the bankers on top of which they receive all their bonuses? <laughs> and I said, no, this is actually a really exciting idea uh, and we can completely eradicate poverty. And what we see now is that there are dozens of experiments happening all over the globe. There was actually a recent piece in the New York Times about the, the huge wave of experiments in the US. Um, and I think that's really exciting. People are starting to realize that poverty is not a lack of character. It's just a lack of cash. And how do you solve a lack of cash? Well, you give people money. That's what you do. Because poor people themselves are the experts on their own lives. There's nothing wrong with them. They just don't have the, the means. They don't have the venture capital to invest in their own lives. And what the evidence shows us quite clearly, again and again, is that when you invest in people, when you give them the means to make their own choices, a lot of positive things happen, you know? Kids do better in school, health improves, people find new jobs, they start new companies, they actually are able to pay more in taxes. So again, this often pays for itself. Um, and it's one of those ideas that really moves beyond the standard, you know, divide between the left and the right. Um, well, that's a pretty, that's a pretty that radical one. If, you, if you're talking about wealthy paying more in taxes and the poor getting more cash, you're talking about radical redistributions of wealth from the ruling class to everyday workers, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. You're, yeah, you're, yeah. Inch, but, you're, you're inching us 
you're inching us away from capitalism <laughs> bit by bit, sir. I, 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 uh, I can't wait for your next <laughs> book, which will, which will be that, when you have the full conversion. Anyway, it is an incredible conversation. It's an incredible book. Thank you so much for, for joining us on Upfront. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Everyone, that is our show. Upfront will be back next week.